Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here. And today I've got a very interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. This is the Rob Johnson's Cedar, which has spent a lot of time with me. I've had a lot of pocket time with this guy. Uh, I, uh, I'm a huge fan, gigantic fan. Um, I don't think there's a lot of information about this knife out there. Uh, Rob Johnson's is uh, a company that's actually run by a gentleman named Nicholas, and the knives are, are made in Latvia. Now, there are machine elements and hand elements, but if you're wondering what tier is this in, uh, we are looking at similar quality to Oz Machine Company, Koenig, Herman, uh, Brown Knives. That's what you're looking at. Do not expect this to cost the same as a Wii knife. It will not. It is absolutely a step above Hinderer, Chris Reeve, companies like that. Um, and uh, they're also going to always be, you know, smaller batch. Now, as of right now, uh, if, I, if I didn't mention, it's the same company who does the Cypress V2, which I think you guys have seen. I have not actually handled that knife, but a bunch of other reviewers have taken a look at it. Um, this is a larger model and a totally different model. Um, and I don't know if they're taking pre-orders for this or the Cypress right now. It depends on when you're watching this video. I will link his website down in the description. It's actually kind of hard to find on Google. Google doesn't want to uh, link you to the correct site. It's, it actually goes to a different Rob Johnson knives. Um, but uh, that's, uh, this, the company was named after his great-grandfather, um, who apparently was a very talented blacksmith. That's what it says on the About Us section of the page. Um, but uh, Nicholas was kind enough to send this in for me to take a look at, for me to experience and share with you guys. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, thanks to my patrons for supporting me, and please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. So let's go ahead and measure the knife, get some specs, and then I'll talk to you about my experience with this absolutely wonderful piece of cutlery. We're coming in at maybe just a hair over eight and a quarter. It's like 8.3. Uh, blade length, 3.75 inches of blade. We have 3.65 inches of cutting edge. This has really great ratios. Uh, it just really feels like they packed in as much blade as possible into this handle. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons. So up against, uh, by the way, any custom scales you find in this section can be found down in the description under Original Go and others. Uh, up against the 8010 and the 8020.5. You can see here, this is not a small knife. Now it carries like a much smaller knife. But it is, in fact, not a small knife. It's nowhere near as robust as the 8010, especially with the tie scales on it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a little bit on the larger side, I think, versus what people are used to on average, right? This is right in my happy zone. <laughs> Such a stupid word. <laughs> my preferred zone of carry. Um, so, yeah. Definitely larger than the 8020.5. Let's do uh, the Spyderco PM2 and the Spyderco Para 3. Extremely similar to the Spyderco PM2. It's almost exactly the same overall length, but you can see here you have so much more cutting edge um, while maintaining most of the ergonomic profile. Like, you, like this has beautiful ergonomic zones, and you can get very comfortable choked up. Uh, or in the standard hammer grip, but you have what, almost an inch more cutting edge. It's it's wild. Uh, and then finally, let's put it up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue, and the Hogue Deca. How is the action on this knife? This is one of those things that's very hard to describe. <laughs> it's very hard to describe to uh, a viewing audience without feeling it. There are different tiers of action, and fall shut. If you've never experienced fall shut past a certain tier, fall shut is fall shut, right? You see it on camera and you're like, oh yeah, I got Civivi knives that do that. You do have Civivi knives that fall shut and other, you know, inexpensive knives. But past a certain point, it stops being just about falling shut. It's a feeling. And that feeling can progress and becomes, you know, exponentially higher quality feeling. Now, are you gaining some sort of utilitarian advantage? No, but it is a testament to the maker's ability to <laughs> machine these things on such an intricate and complex level. This is absolute top tier action. 
we are in uh, like Shirogorov, uh it's it's Shirogorov level smoothness. Um, multi, it, it feels like multi row bearing, you know, from from Shiro. Just absolutely spectacular. I have uh, I've got fifteen hundred dollar, or I, honestly, that one from Shiro that's like fifteen, sixteen, or seventeen hundred dollars. The action honestly feels just as good, if not better. Um, the quality of this action is absolutely astounding. It is so smooth that, you know, with my eyes closed, I couldn't tell you what, where exactly the blade was just by, t I mean, like, you know, if I didn't know where the handle was, I guess, in relationship to the blade and I had my eyes closed. It is, sometimes I reserve this for knives like this, the, this description. It's like taking two pieces of perfectly manufactured glass and putting olive oil between them, right? Imagine that. Close your eyes and imagine that with me. <laughs> That's what it feels like. It is astounding. A lot of, you know, knives that have fall short of action, you can achieve that action just by having bearings and, you know, a blade that's heavy enough to fall, right? And it's it's good enough, but it does not feel anywhere near as luxurious as this. This is the difference between shutting the door on a 1994 Chevy Silverado and a 2024 Cadillac Escalade. The feeling of the door shutting is just like, it's just... Oh, it's smooth, right? Not that uh, 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 clank like metal. Hey, nothing against a 94 Silverado. You can't kill those trucks. Those are great. But wow, there's a huge difference. It's beautiful. Access to the lock bar surprisingly only cut out just a hair. That's what it looks like. Just a hair. It actually might be flush, but you can still get in there. To the maker, my suggestion here, cut that lock bar insert lower and then lip the lock bar insert itself above the show side scale so that you have better access moving over, if that makes sense, right? Uh, a good example of that, actually, I'll get out a knife that does it really well. And the only reason I'm making these critiques is because, you know, I'm a reviewer and that's what the, that's what the maker's looking for. They're not looking for me to tell them that the knife's absolutely perfect and they shouldn't change anything. Uh, this is what I'm talking about. The lock bar insert on this Evo Typhoon is actually lipped above the frame, giving you better access as you move over. Rather than having to push your thumb down in that area and then push over, this is just adding a slight bit of um, quality of life, right? It just makes it just slightly easier, slightly more natural to close, right? Uh, that would be my suggestion there. But really, truthfully, the lock bar is very easy to move over. Uh, and the flipper tab is okay, right? I find myself running into this ledge right here. I uh, I like that the flipper tab is low profile. If you push button it, you kind of end up getting pinched a little bit. It's okay. But I'll tell you what's absolutely perfect is the opening hole. Boy, that is just spectacular. It's got plenty of room to get your finger in there. Reverse flick it. I just basically ignore the fact that the flipper tab exists. Because that opening hole is just perfect. And the detent is also wonderful. Tuned exactly right for uh, the knife to be opened right there. Uh, I, uh, I, the, the entire time that I carried it, sorry, moving stuff around here. The entire time that I carried the knife, I did not use the flipper tab. Um, it's neat that it's there. Uh, I think for people who really, really like flipper tabs, maybe in the future considering changing this ledge right here and making the the flipper tab slightly more pronounced. I can see what he's trying to do here. Excuse me, making the flipper tab very low profile and sort of not take up any, mo any more room than the natural lines of the frame. But it makes it a little bit... It works. It's just not very satisfying. But wow, the uh, opening hole is extremely satisfying. God, and the action is just absolutely beautiful. It's really spectacular. Carry profile, thickness up against the Spyderco Pair 3. This is where the knife doesn't feel gigantic. In fact, it's actually thinner than the Spyderco Pair 3. Length and height up against the PM2 and Pair 3. This actually carries very similarly to the PM2 without the height. It's a little longer than the Pair 3, obviously. Um, but yeah, it, it really carries like a knife that is not smaller, not like in like a more fragile way. It just you you can't you forget how much blade you're carrying until you open the thing up and you're like oh yeah geez oh got a lot of cutting edge there let's weigh it what are we looking at for materials here so mine is a beautiful and you have to forgive my 
fingerprints. The way that this is textured, you kind of get grit and pocket link kind of stuck down in there, but you can easily just wipe it off. Uh, but we have a beautiful, teeny tiny little diamond uh, pattern right there, which is really great and adds meaningful traction. Uh, when you're holding it. And then mine is RWL34. Now you do have options for other steels. I think periodically he works with MagnaCut. I know that he works with Vanax. I know that he has a saltwater build version of this, which I think would mean every last bit of the knife is titanium. Uh, or, uh, well, I'm sorry, the blade would be Vanax and everything else would be titanium. Um, that'll cost you a little more money. Um, I don't mind RWL34. That's a, a steel that a lot of custom makers and semi-custom makers like to work with because it performs very similarly to CPM154, which is a great steel. It's one of my favorite steels ever. And it also is very easy to apply various finishes to, in this case, a near mirror flat. Um, so if you want to spend some more money and get a more premium steel, you, you can. Um, but the base material for the blade is RWL34, and I find that completely and totally acceptable. <laughs> Um, so, excuse me, my nose is running. We have uh, heavily milled out titanium scales, titanium clip, titanium backspacer, and RWL34 for the blade. What does this big boy weigh? Not even four ounces. It's, this is wild. <laughs> 3.75 inches of blade and 3.99 ounces. Really great. Um, in the uh, weight department. The balance is back from the pivot a ways, but it does feel really good. Much lighter in hand considering how much knife uh, you know, you're actually carrying. Let's go ahead and uh, do a hardware check. I'm gonna get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the section of my description that talks about the tools I use in this channel. He had messaged me and said, I'm sending you another, uh, an another pivot. Now that pivot's not here yet, and I don't know what that is. I'll, I'll update you guys on a live stream at some point. Um, but uh, the pivot that he's got in here is just fine. Um, I, uh, I wonder if, you can see it's captive. Why it has a head right there, I'm not really sure. But the pivot is captive, so you really only need to adjust one side. And I thought that might be a T10, it's not. It's gonna be a T8. So let's put that T8 in there. I have not had to adjust this knife the entire time. I've probably deployed this knife 250 times, used it, carried it. Nothing has needed adjustment. So the pivot is definitely a T8 and this side that doesn't need to have. I wonder, you know what? He said he sent me another pivot. I bet you he's sending me a pivot that is not doesn't have the Torx head. It's just like a decorative pivot. That would make sense to me. One body screw back here, gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. My guess is this is nested in or lipped in right there to negate the necessity of another fastener. But the way that he's done this is absolutely beautiful. T8, T8, and you're in there. Really nice. Super minimal hardware. Beyond minimal hardware. As long as you have the right tools for the job, you should be good to go. Let's measure the um, blade stock thickness real quick and then get on with the meat and potatoes because I've got, I've got some, uh, some stuff to say about this knife. Uh, the blade stock thickness is coming in at 125 thousandths, which I think is just fine. On the thinner side, if 130 is the um, median. Okay, the Rob Johnson Cedar. Um, wow, what a nice knife. I mean, what a nice knife. You look at this, this is an attractive it, it build. It, it looks purposefully built. It looks like it's got personality, despite having some pretty classic knife lines. Um, the Rob Johnson Cedar has that look that people like. Um, this area right here, initially I thought that's curiously large for the hammer grip, but it's just big enough to where it gives your index finger a little bit of room and you have enough, I have enough handle room left over back here to where I can kind of adjust a little bit without feeling forced into a proper zone. So I think I can understand why I did that. You can also choke up up here in this flat zone, which is not specifically carved out like a finger choil, but you can do that. I, I am constantly worried about running my finger up on the edge and that edge is very sharp. Um, so I don't do this very often. Most of the time I just hold it like this and it's plenty comfortable. The pocket clip is well back from the halfway zone. It's also flat and textured, but not super sharp out here and there's no bill curving up into the hand. So you basically don't notice that clip. And that's why I always say, keep it shallow. Milled is great. Don't give any sharp corners, right? 
Um, and keep it back from the halfway zone, especially on a knife like this that has lots of handle. It really is comfortable. Now, the scales are not contoured. Um, so that, I mean, which would definitely add another uh, layer of, of comfort and we don't have like an actual forward twirl, just a big flat zone up here. But for the space you have available for your hand, it's very, very comfortable. I was never in a situation where I felt like, uh, this knife is uncomfortable to hold, uncomfortable to use. And you know, the, the funny thing about this texturing is there's a, there's a certain point where you, if you go too far, too heavy on the texturing on titanium, it just becomes a cheese grater. Uh, and so I like a grippy texturing. Number one, I like how diamond texturing looks, especially when it's really teeny tiny like this. That's just really satisfying. But uh, I, I like it to, uh, I like to be able to feel it and I like it to be able to, uh, you know, offer meaningful traction because it's otherwise titanium can be a slippery surface. But I don't like it to go too far, you know, where it carves up my pants um, and my hands. Um, this is right there. It's perfect. It's actually a little bit lighter than what Migeron does uh, with their diamond texturing, and I find this to be absolutely perfect. Now, something that bothered me a little bit, it wasn't bad. There's, with this being a pocket clip that is only mountable for right-handed carry, you should go ahead and mill a bald spot underneath that clip so that it, it slides in and out of the pocket easier, right? Uh, do I have a, an example? No, I don't think so. Um, it just makes it easier uh, to do that in and out of the pocket, we have we have enough texturing there that it kind of build it, it, it'll it'll slowly uh, fray your your pocket seam. Um, so that would be that'd be a nice little touch there, but that's okay. It's not that big of a deal. The blade has the little steps on there, um, so does that slow you down when you're cutting something like cardboard? Let's use a piece of cardboard here. No, not really like not at all um a lot of people worry about the steps maybe maybe somebody who like cuts a ton of styrofoam the the more uh abrasive i guess the material the more dense the material you might notice it more right but the, it's so fine it is so so fine i think more really it's more of an aesthetic decoration than anything else but i didn't find that it slowed me down at all. This blade, this edge, is a joy to, God, it is just a joy to use. And the final cutting bevel is so perfect all the way down on both sides. It's just beautiful. I um, I love the contrast with this small mirror flat up top, or near mirror, it's not quite, right? We have a little swedge, and we've got the stepped blade, whatever we call that. I'm saying that for lack of a better term but the aesthetic of this is so nice and it's honestly even a bit different than what we see on the titanium which has a little bit of like light polishing on the bevel so you have all these different areas with a light catches textured smooth polished matte you got all these different areas that that highlight as you turn the knife around it's just an absolute joy to look at has to be on purpose obviously right Really cool. Nice tip, nice belly, super great slicer. Really fun to use. One of those knives where every time I pulled it out of my pocket, I put a smile on my face every single time. Really, really gorgeous. Now, a lot of people, you know, or you already know, um, I, I have to point this out, how the swedge comes up and we have this area right here, this peak spine of the blade, which by the way, look at that. It's perfectly centered. Really satisfying to look at. All the lines flow together. There aren't any lines running into areas that don't look, it, it doesn't look, it, it looks like he designed the blade to go with the handle. Which is, you see a lot of modern designs and it's like they designed the handle and then just slapped a blade on there that they thought everybody would like and it just doesn't go. The whole thing goes. The whole thing goes together. It's really beautiful. Um, edges of the inside of this whole are, you can see there's a little bit of a bevel right there. So that's nice. It's not carving up your fingers. There's no part of this knife it feels unfinished. Um, or sharp um, outside of the cutting edge, of course, but really just beautiful. It's exactly what you should expect from a knife in this tier, right? If you've never handled a Koenig, an Oz, uh, uh, brown knives, right? 
uh, Herman knives. If you've never handled them, it's easy to look at them and go, oh, that's just overpriced nonsense. And, you know, enthusiasts get a little bit, you know, over, uh, you know, self-justifying in their purchases. And there's not really that much difference between the knives that I have between two and three hundred dollars and some of this stuff. Yeah, everybody thinks that until they handle it, right? It's easy to think that we're all nose in the air, but, you know, understand this. What I'm saying right now is it's coming from a person who very much enjoys the budget zone uh, and has not lost touch with, you know, the value you get on a knife under $100. I, in fact, I am so completely and totally immersed in the less expensive side of the nice knife world. I'm so immersed there that my, my viewers regularly complain about how often I talk about budget knives, right? So... Don't lump me in. Don't assume that I've lost touch and don't understand what, you know, cost utility ratios anymore. No. But you handle as many knives as I do and you can start identifying what goes into the knives at these different tiers. Now, oftentimes you're not gaining back an equivalent amount of utility for the amount of money you, that goes into the knife. At some point, the utility sort of maxes out and you're getting a lot of extra other things that are indicative of you know, more quality and more effort, more attention to detail, but you're not necessarily gaining anything extra in, in the utility department, right? But the buyers of this stuff know that. They're not trying to buy dollar for dollar utility as we go up into the multiple hundreds. What they're trying to buy is quality that is something, it, it's, it's a level of quality that can only be felt, right? A level of effort that you only find past a certain point. And it's these small batch, semi-custom knife makers. They've got the you know, the CNC stuff, and they're doing everything ultra precision. This is, this level, you, the level of quality that I'm trying to describe here can only be felt in a lot of cases. You can see a lot of the aesthetic attention to detail, but a lot of this, you got to feel it, right? And it's no coincidence that there are so many people out there that speak so highly of knives in this territory. It's very easy to assume that we're all full of crap, right? And we've lost touch with reality. No. In fact, it's the exact opposite. We've handled this stuff and <laughs> have been um, exposed to it. And once you're exposed to it, it's like, oh, wow. I remember the first time for me. I remember first, I remember handling a Conagarius and going, oh, crap. Everybody was right. I was very critical. Uh, I was like, I can't be, I, I don't know why they're charging that much more for it. I mean, it's, it's got to be like the same thing as an XM18, right? Huge. I'm a huge Hinder fan. Then I handled it and I was like, oh, wow. No, actually, wow. They were not full of crap. No, I was wrong, right? And that's how it's going to be. For the vast majority of people, you get an opportunity to handle this stuff and all of a sudden it clicks, right? Not saying everybody needs it. I'm saying it is not, these are not imaginary elements, Right? Um, you're just going to have to trust me until you get an opportunity to handle something like this. But this is what you'd expect. It is exactly. The, in fact, I dare say I, I'd say it's actually, you know, challenging knives that cost a little bit more money than this. This guy came out of nowhere. <laughs> this guy, Nicholas, came out of nowhere. Uh, it was Tri-State that was like, you got to you got to handle this. I got a Cypress here and it's so good. And I was like, yeah, yeah. What's so special about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know. So thank you to Tri-State for, you know, making me aware. Um, simple backspacer. It doesn't need to be anything crazy. Something else I really appreciate, Nicholas, you didn't put any branding on this whatsoever. There's nothing. <laughs> he was like, no, nah, man, the, the quality is going to speak for itself. I don't need to put Rob Johnson's all over it. I don't need to put anything on there. He doesn't have to put the name of the knife. He didn't even put, I don't even think it has the blade steel on it, right? It comes in a box like this and uh, it'll say, you know, what this, this is number 12. It'll say exactly what the material is, right, et cetera. Uh, but that's what you're getting as far as um, the COA. It's kind of neat that they, they build it into the box. But yeah, uh, really appreciate that we don't have any of that branding on there. It does have a steel lock bar insert, um, and it is attached to the, um, here, let's see if we can get in there and take a look. Uh, you can see how it's attached. It's got a peg and a screw, and you don't even see it at all from the outside, but it is a steel lock bar insert that doubles as the over travel stop, which is fantastic. Um, and your stop pin is located, 
actually internally right there. So we got a, you can see the stop not moving and you have a little area in the blade carved out so that it stops in the open and the closed position. Obviously runs on bearings. No blade play up, down, left, or right. No lock stick at all. No pivot lash. Incredibly smooth. No detent lash. A reliable frame lock. Reliable enough, right? There's no shortage of channels who will take a knife and smack it way too hard and it'll disengage. Well, of course it does, right? People keep telling me, have you seen the video where he does the frame lock and the frame lock disengage? Yeah, I have. Uh, I don't think anything more than a, a few light spine taps is uh, necessary, right? This survives it. If you use this like a knife, you'll be fine. Now, if you go out and if, if you're like, you know, my daily tasks involve beating on a railroad tie as hard as I can with the spine of my blade. Well, in that case, it's probably going to disengage. I don't know what you guys think that that proves. To me, it doesn't really prove anything. This does what it's supposed to do, right? Now, if we're disengaging on a super light tap, right? This is vinyl upholstery on a plastic Home Depot table. If I take a knife like this and I tap it on the spine three times and it disengages with a light tap, then you've got a problem, right? But if it requires the force of a major league baseball swing to disengage it, probably not. And obviously I'm exaggerating there, but if we're, we don't really need to be banging on it. I used to do the gauntlet and I used to like swing really hard and that was supposed to be funny because it was obviously over the top. I still have some paint guzzlers out there who think that that's how knives should be tested. That, that was a joke, guys. The gauntlet, the old medieval gauntlet was supposed to be a joke. Anyways. Holy crap. I dug myself a hole by doing that. Because people are like, yeah, you know, that's now the that's now the standard, right? I tried to make it a joke, but <sighs> anyways. I the gauntlets aren't gone, right? I just I, I don't people didn't understand that I was trying to be ironic. Um yeah, this does what you'd want it to do, right? Um still no movement, no play. Just absolutely gorgeous. So the base price of this. Um, this my build is like one of the most basic you can get. I think maybe maybe the most basic basic is like no texture, but the base price of this is six hundred and thirty dollars. Yes, that's a lot of money, right? I can get titanium and M three ninety from Wii for two hundred and thirty five. Yeah, you can't, but it's not the same thing. It is absolutely not being made the same way. Uh, it is not being made in the same country. It's being made in China, which dramatically reduces the labor costs, right? The manufacturing costs. We knives are also mass produced, so they're making money on volume. They don't need to make money on, you know, they're not as dependent on the individual knives, right? These are small batch. Much more attention to detail. Much tighter tolerances. Made in Latvia, which... I don't know a lot about their manufacturing costs, but it, it's definitely more expensive than China. In fact, let me, I'll tell you how confident I am. I know absolutely nothing about manufacturing costs in Latvia. I know for a fact it is much more expensive than China. It's, it's cheaper to do anything in China, right? Um, small batch, much higher levels of quality, quality that really has to be felt, right? You can see a lot of it, but a lot of it definitely does have to be felt. Um, and uh, the effort here is just magnificent. Really nice design. Uh, for people who have climbed the ladder and have graduated into this tier, right, and you are, your comfort zone is between $500 and $1,000, and you're familiar with these other, you know, competitors that I was mentioning, um, yes. My answer to this is yes, absolutely. You, you, you need one of these in your collection. Now, if you're still climbing the ladder, right, there's no reason to go out and spend $630 on a pocket knife. You can get a good pocket knife for 50 bucks these days. This is a collector enthusiast knife who looks for those details, is bored to tears with, you know, the sub $500 knife world and, and is looking for the extra. The utility of the object only goes so far. They're happy with that, but they want the extra, right? That's who this is for. And you'll find it here. Absolutely. Um, but again, if you're not, if you're not quite to this territory, right, then, you know, there's, I'm not going to say you should rush out and buy this. Uh, to, to many people, this would be like, kind of like a grail knife, you know, and to a lot of people, it'd just be another knife that they add to their collection and use periodically. The nice thing about this knife is this does have enthusiast elements. It does have collector value. Absolutely. And it's also a wonderful tool, a wonderful tool, right? So for people who understand that trifecta, this is one of those knives. This is one of those knives you should strive to get. 
And it might not be the easiest thing in the world to get your hands on, but when you do get your hands on it, it will absolutely be worth it, right? So uh, I wanted to explain a little bit before I put it into the playlist, the appropriate playlist. This is one of my favorite knives that I've reviewed on this channel. Uh, I've reviewed, I've, I've got over 4,000 uploads, so I have a lot of knives that I consider top tier. This will go in my favorite knives of all time playlist, but it will not go in my recommended knives playlist because it's just, well, actually, I am going to put it in there, but it's like with an asterisk, right? Um, <laughs> recommended for people who are specifically looking to buy in this tier, looking for these elements, this level of quality but not recommended to everybody, right? So if you made it to this point of the video, you have context on that. It's gonna go in both. Gorgeous, absolutely wonderful. Uh, Rob Johnson's is a company I'm gonna be paying attention to um, because this is really spectacular. I just can't believe this just came out of nowhere. <laughs> really, really spectacular stuff. Okay, guys, that's gonna be it. We're going on, wow, it's a 30 minute review. I'm sorry, I get excited about stuff like this. Really great, can't wait to uh, you know continue to EDC this knife. It's really wonderful. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.